Hallelujah. Father, thank you that we can be here again for the second half of this Jesus unit. And uh, I'm amazed that you brought me around the world and back again in these two weeks. And some of us have gone here and there, but here we are back again to break open your word. Teach us your word. Let it come alive to us. And as we look at this subject of ministering like Jesus, ministering the word like Jesus, preaching and teaching like Jesus, illuminate us, cause our hearts to burn within us, speak to us. Uh, Where we need a wake-up call, Lord, wake us up. Where our eyes need to be open, open up our eyes. Where our ears need to be open, open up our ears. Lord, consume us with the fire of God once again. Clear out the debris and the garbage and the junk. And let us be a holy habitation for your presence and glory. And I ask tonight that the words would flow out of my mouth, the illustrations, the stories, the testimonies. And that we would be blessed as we hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen Amen. Amen and amen. Okay, tonight's session, the first session is entitled The Living Sermon. The Living Sermon. And we're going to be looking at number one and two of Ministering the Word Like Jesus. This is Practical Ministry 201. But also what we're going to be doing uh, is continuing on from what we've uh, left off uh, off of in the Gospels, in the Sermon on the Mount. So we'll be uh, marrying the two together, the Gospels and this new subject of ministering the Word. So are you with me? You're okay? We've got to pray. Put your hands on your hearts. I mean, I prayed, but I want to lead you in some action prayer. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus speak, to my heart. speak to my heart. Stir my heart. Stir my Change, my life. Change my life. In your precious name. In your precious name. Amen. Amen. Put your hands on your heads. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus renew, my mind. renew my mind. I rebuke all distractions, rebuke all distractions. In, Jesus name. in Jesus name. Hallelujah. And uh, put your hands on your hips or your waist. Right now, Jesus, Jesus, I receive your belt of truth. truth. Amen. Amen. And last but not least, the feet. Help me to walk it out. out. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, the living sermon, number one and two, ministering the word like Jesus. Let's get into this. So let me introduce this to you. Today, we will continue to focus on the Sermon on the Mount, and this will also lead us into our new subject, like I was saying before, ministering the Word like Jesus. We're going to ask a few questions throughout this uh, teaching and these sessions. For example, what is a sermon? How did Jesus preach, and how can you preach like him? And what was Jesus' main burden in the Sermon on the Mount? So these are uh, the questions, some of the questions that we're going to answer, ask and answer in these sessions. Now let's begin by looking at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew Chapter 7, verse 28. So turn there with me. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28. Hallelujah. All uh, shifting. You're all in order. You're all in gear. Ah. Is the door locked downstairs? Yeah. You got to get here on time. (laughs) So Matthew 7... Verse 28. Are you there? Good. When Jesus had finished these words, so Jesus had just finished this Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. 
For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So let me read that again. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So this brings up a couple more questions. Why did Jesus teach with authority? What made his preaching different from the scribes and the preachers of his day? Any ideas? Any thoughts? Yeah, he was speaking as if he would have written it. That's good. He's one with the Father. Good. Any other thoughts? Preach on repentance, but you can preach on repentance without authority. The question, or, or the thing that I really want to draw out here, bless you guys, the thing, that, the thing that I really want to draw out here is that he was teaching them as one having authority. So he taught with authority. And this was different than how the scribes were teaching. The scribes were teaching the word of God, and they knew the word of God. And yet they were not teaching with authority. So there's two ways the word of God can be taught. It can be taught with authority, or it can be taught without authority. So it can be taught like the scribes, who also knew the word, and people today can know the word, and not still teach with authority. But Jesus, when he taught, he taught with authority. So why, how was it that Jesus taught with authority, and how can you teach with authority and preach with authority? This is what we're exploring. This is what we're asking. Are you with me? Yes. Next time, come a little bit earlier so you can prepare your heart and your mind. Oh, yes. Amen. So, amen. I hear faith in that statement. Um, your assessment this term, and this term is a shorter term, it's six weeks, is to write and deliver a 10-minute sermon to the school. So you're going to be writing and delivering a 10-minute sermon to the school. The time limit is going to be strict because there's many of us. And so I want you to pay a special attention to what I'm going to say. I don't want you to freak out. Oh, no, and turn off. I want you to listen. But pay special attention because you're going to need to put this into practice. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I see that look of fear in someone's eyes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So let's talk about this some more. Jesus taught with authority because he lived what he taught. He lived it for 30 years before opening up his mouth. And these silent years are of absolute importance because during this time, his life and his message was formed. So before he got up and spoke this Sermon on the Mount, he spent 30 years listening to the Father, 30 years of growing, as Luke t tells us, in wisdom and stature in the favor of God and man. 30 years of the Father forming him, 30 years of silence, 30 years of listening to the Father. And so that when he came and he shared, he spoke out of a place of, let's say, a deep well. Yeah. There was a deep well that he was drawing from, from all those years that he was listening to the Father. Now, he taught with authority as a man. We need to realize that when he came on earth and he became a man, he left his, uh, he, he laid aside 
his divine powers to do things, to learn like a man. So this is called the kenosis. He emptied himself so that he would need to rely on the Father to grow just like you and I would have to grow. So during these years, he learned to listen. Jesus was and is the living sermon and the living message. He was sent by the Father and submitted to the Father. And this is what gave him authority when he spoke. Because he was sent by the Father, he was coming not of his own accord. That's what gave him authority. Just like if Australia was sending an ambassador to the U.S., Well, the president and the um, government would open up their doors to them and receive them and welcome them. But if you go and you say, well, I'm going to take a plane and try to get an audience with the president, you wouldn't get an audience with President Trump. Are you following me? You know, you're going to be knocking on the door, but they're going to say, well, who are you? Because you haven't been sent You haven't come with authority. You are not representing the nation. But Jesus came as a son representing the Father. He was sent. He had authority because he received that authority from the Father. He wasn't doing his own thing or going of his own accord. He didn't just buy a ticket and then show up at the White House, so to speak. But he came with authority. So he was sent by the Father, and he was submitted to the Father. And this is what gave him authority when he spoke. And these are the same principles that are going to give you authority when you speak. So we're learning from the Master. We're learning from Jesus about how to preach and to teach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How are you going so far? Good? That's good. Give me an amen. Amen. Give me a hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give me a glory to God. God. Hallelujah. I I need your help, you know, because I've been around, in two weeks, I've been around the world and back again. And I missed you too, big time. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I sat there and you guys came around me and prayed for me. All of your 30 30 or so hands or more came on me, and you guys laid hands on me and prayed for me, and that meant a lot. That really comforted me. And remember, I got up, the last time I got got up here, I didn't have the money for the tickets, and I had about $250 for the trip. Remember I told you that? And I said, I hope to come back with a testimony. And I said, in Jesus' name, I'll come back with a testimony of what God did. Some of you have heard that testimony. Hallelujah. Then some of you chipped in and put money in an envelope. And you know, those few loaves and fishes that you gave me, God multiplied them. And then it was a a real blessing. And I came back with a few extra basketfuls coming back. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, my dad blessed us with check, uh, chess boards from New York. So we got three chess sets. And those are nice weighted pieces. Those are nice weighted pieces. Nice. And there's more, there's more back there. So my dad uh, blessed us with that. So, well, I was going to honor, I was going because God said, honor your father. And that was the purpose of the trip. Now, when I got there, I was amazed because, well, a couple days in, I got really sick. And I got so sick, I felt like I was hit in the head with a sledgehammer. And uh, I was in bed for about 24 to 32 hours just sleeping. It was was, uh, quite bad. And at that time, someone kept on calling me, trying to, like, pursuing me that I had not talked to in a long, long time. But I knew them when I got saved over, how long ago was that? 
uh, 25 years ago. So, and uh, I didn't know that they were following the morning thoughts and following what God, they, you know, they, in, the, in America, they hear the worship that we have when we take out the phone and we record the worship, well, they hear the worship, they're all blessed by it. And they're blessed by what God is doing here. Some of them want to move here just because of what, just because of what God is doing. So, hallelujah. Well, any, what's that? Yeah, amen. Amen, Tim. So this lady that I had not spoken to in a while says, um, I, God put, the Holy Spirit put it on my heart to give you, and it was a large sum of money. I won't mention how much it was. But it was the exact amount of money to, sh- to cover the shortfall so that the tickets could be completely paid for. Wow. Hallelujah. And so I, I came back debt free. F- from needing, you know, the trip, I only, bought, I only booked the tickets a few days before I left. And I, I needed about, oh, in total, the whole trip, uh, anywhere from five to $6,000. And God had provided. But that's not just, that's what Gideon and I needed for the trip. Plus, I need to believe God for the finances for my own family. Plus, I need to believe God for all the finances for the church and Bible school, which is about $10,000 a month, um, just to, for things to survive. So this is a lot to believe for. And that's why I ask you to join in faith every month, because every month is a miracle. Every month is a walk of faith um, in the ministry. And, uh, but amazingly, God provided. And that's the testimony. And it all came from the Holy Spirit spoke. So I was not going of my own volition. Like, I, I submitted my will to God. I even have it in my journal, which I wrote. Uh, the Lord spoke to me, go visit your father, honor your father. I want you to visit him. And then he had me write down all expenses paid. Wow. So then I wrote this down in big capital letters, all expenses paid. And I believe that the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, but I was like that man, I believe, but help my unbelief. And then you wonder, am I crazy? And Patrick confirmed on Sunday that, yes, Glenn, you are crazy. (laughs) (laughs) And so I wondered, am I just, is this just me or is this God? And I think when God speaks to you, there should be that sense of uh, reliance or dependence or not a cockiness. You know, not a cockiness, oh, God spoke to me and I'm going to do it. And there should be a a fear and trembling because you are human and you can make mistakes. Uh, But hallelujah, I was so blessed to hear. And that person was going to mail the check to me, even though uh, they lived in that area. They were going to mail the check to me. But I said, Uh, God had been speaking to me about honor, and honor comes. Honor goes to people. Honor comes to people. You don't just, you know, remain at a distance. Jesus honored us by coming to us. He became man. He came to us. He sat down with tax collectors and sinners. He was with them. He listened to them. Uh, He spent time with them. Excuse me. And uh, so honor comes. So I said to her, um, can I come? And uh, pray over the offering and spend time with you. And it was wonderful because I got to hear some of the testimonies and how she was blessed that she heard from God. You know, I heard from God to go over there. She heard from God about this amount of money. And it was a big step of faith for her because it's a large amount. And so and then we got to share testimonies and things that things that uh, God was uh, doing. And now there's going to be somebody extra praying for us here. In Australia. So more than uh, the financial provision, having those relationships in the kingdom are so important. And what was amazing about this, this one is I was totally surprised. Totally surprised with who did it and how it happened. Hallelujah. Okay. Moving forward. 
there's a vast difference between speaking about God's word and speaking God's word. So there's a vast difference between speaking about God's word and speaking God's word. So during the time I was in America, I visited different churches. And I had a real sense, and I won't say where or what places, that at least in one place that there was a speaking about God's word. And it was a decent speaking about God's word. It wasn't a distortion of God's word. But it didn't seem like they were speaking God's word, what God was saying for right now or a message from heaven. It was just speaking about that word. And this is the difference with Jesus. He's not just speaking about the word. He's not just teaching about it. Jesus is actually teaching the word of God. What he is sharing is what the people needed for that time and that moment. And as preachers of the word, we need to be like the prophets. And the prophets received a word from heaven. They heard from God. They heard God's voice. They had this uh, message in their heart. And if they couldn't speak it, it was like fire shut up in their bones. They were weary of holding it in. It was something that came with power and with the Holy Spirit. And it was a burden and they had to share this burden. They were compelled to. And the same thing goes for us. That when we're preaching the word, we need a word from heaven. We need to seek God for a word from heaven. That we're speaking what God wants to speak. That we have his heart for the specific people that we're speaking to. And the time and the place. So this causes us not to rely on ourselves. Or our own abilities. Or even our own knowledge. But we're totally cast on God. That he would help us. That he would... uh, That he would guide us, that he would help us, that he would give us the word, that this thing isn't just coming from our heads, but it's coming from his mouth and his spirit. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Joey, can you turn me up just a smidge there? So there's a vast, a little smidge down. (laughs) There's a vast difference between speaking about God's word and speaking God's word. Just a little smidge now. A little smidge lower. Learn from the... A little smidge higher. Learn from the master. Learn from the master. So we want to learn to preach from the master. Who is the master? Jesus. Good. So when I was at... When I was in New York, I had this, uh, I've always wanted to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It has about six million different works of art there. Six million. Yeah, but not all are being displayed at once. Some of it's in storage. But so many different people from from, uh, Greek and Roman times to ancient times to uh, more modern works and uh, Pieces from the 18th century, the 19th century, the 20th century. Picasso, I got to see some Picasso paintings. And one of my favorites is Vincent van Gogh. Yeah, that is a sad imitation over there. <laughs> but uh, that's Vincent van Gogh. I got to see a number of his paintings. So I, found, I was really blessed to go to the art museum. While we were in this art museum, and there's a number of them in New York. There's Momar, there's the Guggenheim. Wow. Um, while I was there, there was these students. And these students would um, set up their, uh, you know, paint and their, their canvas in front of one of these masterpieces. Wow. So these are some uh, famous uh, masterpieces, works of art. And these students were copying these works of art. And you can see you can see them there. I'll oh let's go to Matthew 10, 24, and I'll go close up on some of those paintings in a minute. But what are these students doing? These students are learning from the masters. 
So they're art students, and to learn how to paint, they need to first learn from the masters. And what I'm saying is we need to learn from the master, Jesus. Now, in their lives, they're going to progress and they're going to come up with their own creations and their own works of art. But first, they have to learn from these masters. And so they were working on it. And I was blessed that that day there was a number of them throughout the museum. Matthew 10, 24. I read this last term. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a slave above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master or the servant like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign the members of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the rooftops or the housetops. So let's start on verse 24. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher. And this is what God wants in our life. This is why he's training us. He's discipling us. Jesus is discipling us so that we become like him. And those who are fully trained become like their master, like their teacher. So this is a process of being fully trained that we're in in this Bible school. You know, I could choose to give you some more of a marketable product. You know, what do I mean by a marketable product? Well, maybe I'll make a three-week course yes. and uh, have you come to a few, few times for three weeks. And uh, you would find that manageable. I'll do three weeks and uh, maybe I'll do three nights for three weeks and I'll do a whole uh, subject in this intensive time. And you would find that nice and it would be a good marketable product, wouldn't it? Yeah. But... Here's the thing. I mean, my mind, I'm, a, I'm, I'm business natured. My mind, it thinks about all these sorts of things, but I always have to come back to what does God want? What does the Father want? And what this Bible school is about is not a short-term fix or marketable product, but a long obedience in one direction. We're night after night, we're seeking God. We're being trained. It's one step after another step. Just like Jesus with his disciples, he spent three years with them. And then after he was risen from the dead, he spent time with them, and they were still learning after that. So there is this process of becoming his disciple. It is enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave or the servant like his master. Now we go down to verse 26. Therefore, do not fear them. So he's saying, if I was insulted, you'll be insulted. If I was persecuted, you will be persecuted. Uh, you're not above me. And then verse 27, there's something here that's a key for us learning how to preach. And in order to be a good preacher, you need to first be a good listener. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to bring it back to those silent years. You need these years of silence and quietness and waiting before God. Amen. And even in the times where you're called to speak up, there needs to be a lot of silence and quietness in your life to hear. So what does it say in verse 27? What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered to your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. So what I tell you in the darkness. So there is a need for us to go into the darkness. We're not talking about the darkness of sin, but the darkness of being hidden with God, of getting into the secret place, into the closet, and shutting the door, and just spending time with the master, and the time where you're not in front of the limelights, and people are, people are not looking at you. 
It's really what happens in the secret place that determines your effectiveness in the public place. The, that's your roots. Nobody sees the roots. Nobody sees the roots, but that is the power and the strength and the stability of the plant. That really is what makes a preacher preach with authority rather than just be someone that is uh, like a scribe teaching about the word, but not actually speaking God's word. Amen. Amen. So what I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. And what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. So the Lord wants to speak. He wants to whisper to you. Just like he whispered to Elijah. And Elijah heard the still small voice. And it's the things that you hear in the quiet place that he wants you to proclaim and make known and lift up your voice. Hallelujah. So we're learning from the master. Amen. And we're going to look in the sermon of on the mount some more. We're learning from the master. Yep. When you're taking a well, in the beginning, when you want to eat deep, you can hear the noise of everyone. Mm. The deeper you dig down, the less noise you hear. Yep. Yeah. And the deeper you dig down, the more sound it becomes. Yes. Is that what he's saying? Dig yeah, that, this is a good, this is a good, I, I haven't thought about this, but this is a good illustration. The deeper you go down, the deeper you dig, the more silent it becomes because you're losing touch with all the noise that's on the surface. Good job, Patrick. So here's a close-up of uh, one of the art students, and he's painting a portion of this big, this is a big canvas, very big canvas. He's just painting a portion of that. And then here's another one. And I went by this, and I, I looked at it. I thought, wow, it looks so much like it. But then I looked at it some more, and then I noticed that the color that she uses for the skin is not as yeah. uh, luminescent as her. You know, the, her, her face, it pops. It's like, it's like light. It's like glowing. But what she chooses, and if you saw it in person, this is just a... a an image, but if you see her colors, it's a bit more gray and dull. So, but she's still learning. But at first I thought, wow, it's quite amazing. And then you look more and say, well, she hasn't got it completely yet, but she's quite good. But notice she's looking at her phone. I don't know what the phone has to do with it. But, but I would say that could be part of the problem. <laughs> Here's another one, and a very famous painting, and she's doing that. The kids are all looking around, and yeah, she, she's doing a great, of course, all of them are doing quite an amazing job. So now let's turn to, well, you don't even have to turn there, John 19.5, turn there, yeah, John 19.5, thank you. So we need to learn from the Master Jesus. We also need to learn from those great men and women of God who have become models of preaching the word. They are never to replace Jesus. I'm not talking about the popular preachers of today. I'm not talking about the ones you see on TV. I'm not talking about these people. I'm talking about... The earth, first of all, look at men like the prophets, like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah. Look at these men and learn from these men. Other fathers like Paul, like John, like Peter, these are men we can learn from. Also, we go into the early church history, and you look at the early church fathers. We would, we've been talking about men like Athanasius, Athanasius yes. <laughs> and others uh, like him. You think of men like Spurgeon yes. and uh, Tozer yes. and yes. men like David Wilkerson. Yes. 
especially people who have gone to be with the Lord because we know that their testimony is solid. We don't know about the people that are living today. You know, you may find, you may put, oh man, this person is the greatest. And then all of a sudden you find they've been living in adultery. And uh, well, maybe it's not as great as you think. But usually what happens is why we think these people are great is because we're sucked into their charisma rather than their character. And the thing is, you need to know people's character. The only way you need, the only way you know people's character is if you live close to them. I know your character and how consistent you are by how much you're at Bible school, right? (laughs) <laughs> then I talk to you and I get to know your character. We can't, I can't hide my character in this Bible school because it's all intimate. You know my family. You know my wife. You know my kids. You know my son Gideon. And there's nothing hidden in our lives. But these people that you see on the TV screens, there can be a lot hidden. And I'm telling you, a lot. So I want to encourage you. Learn from the master and learn from the little m masters of the word who have lived it out, who have been tested and tried and have proved faithful like the heroes of the faith that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11. So in John 19, 5, Pilate says something here which is very pr- profound. John 19, 5. Pilate came out again and said to them, Behold, I, bring, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Where did I got? But I'm looking for the part that says, oh, it's, it's five. Okay, good. And verse, verse five, thank you. That's why I have you here. You know, the rabbis used to make little mistakes to see if the students were listening. But I don't make them intentionally. It just happens. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I was wondering where my, like, what has that been here from this morning to now? All right, verse 5. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and a purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Behold the man. Interesting that... This is, uh, if you look at Genesis 3.22, we read something quite similar. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. It's It's the same phrase, but said from a different angle. Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now here, Pilate says, behold the man. In other words, behold Jesus. And at that time, Jesus is not looking very popular at all. He is not looking very powerful. And yet, the Lord is speaking to, through Pilate that we would behold the man. Here is a man that's despised, rejected, People do not esteem him much. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to us. Behold the man. He is the example. He is the master. If he was treated that way, we also will be treated that way as well. On the subject of artists, I was talking about Vincent van Gogh. Interestingly, I'm reading a bit of his biography at the moment. And interestingly... He is one of the great masters. His pieces of art go for millions upon millions of dollars, 50 million, 100 million, 250 million. It's some of the top priced art in all the world. And yet, when he was alive, he only sold one piece of art. And he ended up becoming so despondent that he committed suicide. He was someone who actually in his early life wanted to go into ministry and 
I was just reading one of his sermons in which he is describing this pilgrim going to the eternal city, much like John Bunyan, and it's beautiful. Um, And he did all these beautiful pieces of art, but no one appreciated his art while he was alive. And now people will go crazy over it. What does this tell me? People tend to only be attracted to what other people are attracted to. So if it's popular with people, then everybody gets on the bandwagon. It's called the bandwagon effect. And in marketing, you want the bandwagon effect. In other words, you want to get a number of people. And so you may rent a crowd so that something looks really quite happening. And it looks cool. You rented a crowd. You paid for people to be there. And other people think, wow, this is quite amazing. Or you pay for all these likes on Facebook. You you pay for this. And then people get on the bandwagon and think, wow, this is good. And this is what the music that you listen to today and you think, wow, this is amazing. Well, actually, they just pumped a lot of money in it and made you think it was amazing. But it's not too amazing. (laughs) <laughs> so they, it's just that people are pumping money into it. Yeah. People pump money into these great artists. And because they've pumped money into these great artists, that causes this bandwagon effect. And everybody just starts to follow along. The, and you could do the same thing with Christian ministry, too. In other words, you build this big crowd, and then people come who are attracted to that crowd. We have to watch in our preaching that we're not doing it for the popularity. And we're not, if God is going to grow the thing, let God grow the thing. Let God cause it to expand and multiply. Now, he can do that. We read the book of Acts and the fire spreads and people are saved and, and the church is bursting at the seams. And we've seen God do that in our own school where everybody was in the hallways And uh, that's brought us here. And God causes things to expand. But let us never compromise the word to cause things to expand. Amen? (laughs) Val, it's wonderful to have you here tonight. (laughs) Hallelujah. Can I share a testimony, Gwen? Yeah, let's let's get this here. The reason why I'm, like, happy is there was this page, you know, this church in Melbourne, and I started loving their stuff, and I was loving their statuses. Then I seen one of the leaders, and I was just taken back, because I was like, oh, he's, you know, small Samoan community. He's, you know, he's a clubber. Um, So I unlike them. Anyway, I meet up with this girlfriend, and um, one of her best friends just happens to be at their church, and she was actually telling me that... um, you know, that the church believes on loving everybody but doesn't believe in the holiness. And then she had a situation and then they gave her this wisdom on how to handle the situation. I was like, dude, that's, that's not godly wisdom. What I'm trying to say is on Facebook, they seem like this amazing ministry and I really like their statuses, but the, the character and the tr- there's no holiness there. And so that's why I'm like, oh my, you know, like we got to be careful that we don't become so popular on social media and all of that. Yeah, We're in our characters right. and that. Yeah. And know it, yeah. So I just wanted to, yeah, when I, when I had that conversation Amen. with her, I was like, oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Val. We've got to make sure that two is down now. So behold the man. Now, one of the things, now this is, a ver- this is the uh, original that I took the, picture of and when you see it in person it's much more beautiful it's much more beautiful in person because you see the textures and you see all the colors and it's when you're in person it's very fascinating so here I am looking at Vincent Van, this is Vincent Van Gogh he would write his little signature Vincent on the bottom uh, and um here it is. Um, I'm here, and I, I want to see this painting. So I'm looking at everything. I'm looking at the texture. I'm looking at the brush strokes. I'm looking at the colors, and I'm looking at it and looking at it. And I'm looking at it so much that the guards are getting nervous. So that an, a guard comes right next to my shoulder and stands there with me. And then another guard comes right there and stands there, kind of hems, hems me in. And then they start, there's ropes, and they start moving the ropes back. 
And I'm thinking, doesn't anybody look at art anymore? It was only about five, 10 minutes, but they were really nervous because everybody just goes past these things. Unless you were an art student and you had your canvas set up and you were allowed to be there. So yeah, then I could have. And so I was looking at this too long that it made the guards uncomfortable. Now, this is what beholding is. The Lord wants us to behold him, to look at him, but not just a cursory look, not just the look of a bypasser that says, I saw that. Let's go on to the next thing. OK, I see that. Oh, I see, see that. Oh, there's Picasso, Michelangelo. That's great. Oh, over, over there, there's uh, uh, another great artist. No, he wants us to look and behold and gaze at Jesus until we see all the details and the things we've missed out on. They were joking with me at church. They said, you're still in the book of Philippians. After all these uh, months, you're still in Philippians. And Anna was saying, oh, yeah, we're never going to finish Philippians. We're going to be in Philippians for the rest of our lives. And uh, this is what we're doing in church. I said, I'm going light on it, too. But this is what happens when you're looking at Jesus and looking at all the different aspects. One word leaps at you or one phrase leaps at you. You find out that this word is very vast and very deep. It's not just like an ordinary word. And this word is crying out to us, behold the man, behold the master. Uh, Learn from him, look at him, see how he lived. And... As you behold them, you're actually changed into his image. You start reflecting him. You start becoming like him. And he wants you to see all the different textures and tones. And, you know, when people look at the sky, often they just see blue. You know, as a kid, you look at the sky and it's blue. And then you look at the grass and it's green. Well, it's not just blue. There's so many shades of blue. There's uh, hundreds and thousands of shades of blue. Yeah. There's, you know, blue gray and, and, and whitish blue. And there's, you know, sky blue or deep blue or darker blue. And at all times of the day, the sky is constantly changing colors. Spe- especially we notice it, it in the dawn and in the sunset. Yeah. But all throughout the day and at different t- places in the world, in different cities, the way the angle of the sun is hitting it, the sky is different colors. Often in New York, it's overcast. Um, that's sad because you don't always get to see the sky. But then in New York, when you f- get to see the sky, you're like, oh, wow, I see the sky. Because it could be like a week or two or three where it's overcast. And you only see a little bit of the sun. And the New Yorkers are used to that. Uh, they don't really think much of it. But when you come from the outside, you know, yeah, from sunny Queensland, you notice that there's big differences. The grass also isn't just one shade of green. If there's been a, if there's been a drought, it's going to be more of a brown, yellowish color. Then there is the color that it, uh, if it doesn't rain so much and before the drought, it may not be a vibrant green. It may be like a darker green uh, or a duller green. But if it's raining a lot, it becomes this vibrant green and it becomes lighter in color. We need to notice, when you're walking around in the world, notice all the different shades. Notice all the different colors. Notice all the different textures. And... With that same, uh, with that same skill or that same uh, mindset, I want you to look at the Word of God. But you need the power of the Holy Spirit to really see the Word of God. But there is these colors and textures and detail and things that other people miss out on. But behold, continue to behold. You know what behold means, right? means to look at deeply, intently, to see with a purpose. It's not just a, a, a seeing of a bypasser, but seeing of somebody who is arrested by someone. You, you're just arrested and enraptured by this thing or here, 
the man, Jesus Christ, who is the man. The man. Amen. He's the man. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Some of you guys are alive and some of you are dead. Well, some are more vocal and some are dead. <laughs> You're not a dead one, right? Hallelujah. Okay, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. Praise the Lord. We'll see who lives it out. We'll see who lives it out. Amen. The Sermon on the Mount. Amen. So in review, we've, we were talking about the Sermon on the Mount before. In review, the Sermon on the Mount is the constitution and cornerstone of God's kingdom. It's the constitution and, and cornerstone of God's kingdom. So I want us to go back to Matthew chapter 5. In the sermon, we see a portrait of Jesus, who he is. And we see that Jesus wants to paint his portrait in us. So when you're reading the Sermon on the Mount, I want you to see that it is a portrait of Jesus. And this is the portrait that he wants to paint in our lives so that we become a living portrait. So we start off where Jesus. Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, after and after he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be... receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed, so how are we going to behold? We need to have a pure heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you, even laugh while you're preaching. Because of me. (laughs) Rejoice and be glad. For your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now I'm only joking with those people that were giggling before. I don't know what it was about and I don't know who it was. (laughs) I just thought it was a good opportunity for a joke. (laughs) Now... When we're reading this, we're reading this, all these uh, values, all these virtues, we're reading a portrait or we're seeing a portrait of Jesus. He became poor. He was the one who was poor in spirit, but God gave him the kingdom of heaven. He became poor on the cross. There's no greater poverty than the poverty experienced on the cross. And he's calling us to have that same heart. We're not talking here about a spirit of poverty poverty where you're wasting your money and not managing it correctly and then you say blessed are the poor in spirit we're not talking about that we're talking here about a poured out life a life that's poured out so that we're totally you're you're a giver you're a sower (laughs) and because of that you don't have too much all the time but you have to rely on God to provide for you now some people God has blessed them with finances, they have a whole base of finances to, to uh, help increase wealth, to give it to others, yeah. and that's good as well. But all of us need to have this heart that is totally that realizes that we are totally uh, poor without Jesus. Yeah. And then blessed are those who mourn. We see Jesus mourned for sin. Yeah. He mourned for the state of the world. Yeah. But he didn't just stay in the mourning, and Jesus didn't just stay in the poverty. Jesus received the riches of the kingdom. Jesus received, she received the comfort that came to him. So in all these 
Beatitudes, blessed means happy. It can be translated as happy, happy to those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. You'll never understand the first part unless you understand the second part. The second part's important because the second part is God coming to the rescue of you when you're mourning. In other words, God comforting you when you're mourning and God supplying his kingdom when you're poor. And then blessed are the gentle. Jesus was gentle. He was meek. Yes. And so he inherited the earth. He, he hungered and thirsted for righteousness. We are too. He was merciful. Any greater mercy than Father forgive them. They know not what they do. He was merciful. This is, so we're seeing a portrait of Jesus. And then he's calling us to follow in his footsteps. He's pure. There's no one purer than Jesus Christ. He's a peacemaker. He made peace with his enemies on the cross. And he was persecuted for righteousness sake. He was insulted. Pilate is saying, behold, the man, when he's insulted, he uh, has his purple robe on, that he's being mocked, and he's, uh, he's bloody from all the, uh, the whipping and the attacks He's been receiving, and he says, in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we're seeing a portrait of Jesus, and this is a portrait that Jesus wants to paint on our own souls in our own lives. And this is the foundation of, this is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So the first section of the sermon is the preamble, or it's Jesus' portrait, but it's incognito. We don't know it's Jesus' portrait until we read the rest of the Gospels. Yeah. And then we realize, oh, wow, yeah. this is Jesus. Yeah. He was the one poor in spirit. He was the one who was mourning. He was the one who was meek. He was the one who was hungering and thirst for, thirsting for righteousness. He was the merciful one. He was the one who was pure in heart. He was the peacemaker. He was the one who was persecuted for righteousness. Say, we're reading about Jesus here. But he's not coming out and saying, this is me. I am the peacemaker. Now, he can at times. He said, I am the vine. You are the branches. But the the normal mode of Jesus speaking, as we read in the gospel, was a very incognito, secretive mode. In other words, he he called himself the son of man. He referred to himself in the third person. Sometimes you don't know he's talking about himself because he's humble. We start off this thing and we're reading Jesus' portrait, but we don't even realize we're reading Jesus' portrait until we start beholding and still we start looking and we ask the Holy Spirit, what is this? What does this mean? So in the preamble, we see the values of the kingdom and our purpose as God's people. These Jesus values are opposite to what we are taught in the world. So like we said before, what we're taught in the world is be rich, be happy, uh, be, uh, you know, take the earth by force, don't hunger and thirst. You know, we're not told uh, don't be merciful. You know, you don't want to be pure in heart. You don't want to be innocent. You got to have some savvy. And we're, we're taught everything opposite to this. So they, these are Jesus values, though, and they're especially seen in Jesus' cross and can only be fully understood in the light of the cross. Yes. So you can only understand this fully in the light of the cross. That's How are you going? Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Now, we'll take a break soon, but... First, I want to talk more about the structure of the Sermon on the Mount, Mount, and uh, we'll look at it more in the next session, too. So the first, it's, I'm dividing it in five parts. I see five distinct parts of the Sermon on the Mount, which remind us of the first five books of the Bible, which is the Torah. And the first part is Matthew 5, 1 through 14. And this is Jesus' portrait, or we can say Jesus' values. I've used P words throughout this. In the past, I said, the last session, I said the kingdom's uh, preamble. 
um, and the kingdom's purpose and the kingdom's priorities. But this time I'm saying it a little bit different. It's the same, same thing, though, the same structure. At the end, this is showing us Jesus' portrait and who we are called to be as a people. So we read in verse 4, near the end of this section, we read, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And this is the last verse of this section. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So your light is shining so much that it's converting people that they start worshiping God. They start glorifying the Father because the light is shining from your life. And this is, our purpose is to be a light. Now, when you are poor, like I was poor, I said I only had a few dollars in my pocket, but here it is, God has called me to go to New York to honor my father because it was one year since my mom had passed away to comfort him, to encourage him. And God had called me to do this, but I said I was poor. But God provided me the provision of the kingdom of heaven, the Holy Spirit moving on a lady to give a large sum of money, and one that I had not talked to. Here is me receiving a blessing or the riches of the kingdom of heaven, which I did not have before. But I came before I started poor. I started, I'm in need. Please pray for me. I'm shaking in my boots. I don't know how I'm going to do this thing. My faith is being stretched. And I'm poor, but I'm not staying poor. I'm opening up myself to the kingdom of heaven. And when I do, this becomes a light. I'm acting on what God spoke to me. I'm doing a good deed for my dad, blessing him. And uh, he... He looks, he was so happy. He was so, he had a huge smile on his face the whole time. He was so happy that we had come. And uh, probably more because Gideon had come. You know, he really loves Gideon. Gideon, it was the real star of the whole thing. I was just, I was just there to carry around Gideon. Oh, oh boy. All the ladies looked at him and said, oh, he's, he looks like a model. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, all, all the ladies were like attracted to him like honey I don't know and like it was, it was quite uh, funny and then we had some older we had one funny time with these older ladies they were in their 70s they said oh he looks like a model and um, then they said oh come for it was, our, it was this uh, walking group that my dad does and uh, the lady said these are older ladies and they said come uh Come on Saturday because then the younger women are coming. And my dad said, how young are the younger women? You know, she's talking to Gideon. You know, Gideon's uh, almost 17. The younger women are coming on Saturday. Well, how old are the younger women? Oh, they're 40. (laughs) (laughs) So we we really laughed about that one. That's the age of Gideon's mom. But when you get to that age, when you get to, you know, the 70s or 80s, all of a sudden everybody looks young to you. You start to lose, lose that, uh, lose sight of that. So the conclusion of this section is let your light shine. So you may be mourning, but as you allow God to comfort you, you, now, the highest mourning is mourning for the sins of this world, wow. mourning for the sins oh, that you see, uh, the, the grieving, the weeping for uh, the lost. Now, but your light starts to shine as you allow God to comfort you, as you allow God to come into your mourning. Amen. The same thing goes for with meekness, hungering, and thirsting for righteousness. Amen. All these things are... Uh, the beginning point of you opening yourself up and receiving from God and God beginning that light, that fire that shines through you. Well, this is the first section. 
Then the next section is uh, part two, and we see Jesus' purpose. And he starts this one off, this section of the sermon. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets, not to get rid of them, but to fulfill them. Like there was like the law and the prophets were like an empty jar, and Jesus came to fill that empty jar. And once he has completely filled those empty jars, you draw from that, and the water turns into wine. At the end of his life, he said, it is finished. In other words, it was fulfilled. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. Hallelujah. So we see Jesus' purpose. And then in this whole section, we start to see what, is it, what does it mean that he fulfilled the law? And what does it mean in our lives that the word of God is fulfilled in us? Then he goes on to say, verse uh, 21, we see him referring to all these uh, parts of the law. You have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. So this is what the ancients were teaching, and they were teaching about God's word. Of course, God's word said you shall not commit murder, right? But they were teaching about God's word. And now Jesus is teaching the word of God as it really is. And he says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty. So then he's talking about the heart. This is what the Lord wants to fulfill in us. He wants us to be living sermons. So what I'm saying to you here is that you need to become a living sermon, a living message, that the love of God is so in your heart that you're not angry with your brother. And in such a way, then the word of God is being fulfilled in your life. The law is being fulfilled in your life. The prophets are being fulfilled in your life in Christ because it's only possible in Christ. So we see how the law is written on our hearts. Do you know that the promise of the new covenant is that the law is written on your hearts? And here it's written on your hearts. Now, there's a whole section of the church that wants to get rid of the Old Testament. I talked about that. Some of you, after I taught on that, you came across people who are trying to get rid of the Old Testament. It's one of the classic heresies that have been around uh, since the early church, uh, the Marcion heresy or the Marcion. It's M-A-R-C-I-O-N. And uh, they wanted to get rid of, he wanted to, and his followers wanted to get rid of the Old Testament. So we see here, well, now we got to take a break in a second. Actually, we're going to take a break now. We're going to pray. We're going to look at this some more in the next section so that we can have some more time on it. How's that sound? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, Lord, we come to you, and we want to be living sermons, Amen. living messages, that the Word of God is fulfilled in our lives, that we are like a living Bible people can read, that we're we're not just not murdering, but we have so much of the love of God in our hearts that we're not angry in our hearts. Let the word be written on our hearts. Let our hearts be circumcised. Let these things be a reality. Let us not just talk about the word of God, but be proclaimers of the word of God. Prophets. Men who hear you or moved by you, who hear your whisper, who uh, spend time with you in the darkness and declare it in the daytime. Lord, move upon us. Make us into these preachers. Jesus had authority because he lived. He lived what he spoke. May we live what we speak and so speak with authority. May we be ones who are sent, not just going of our own volition, where we're sent. Let us be a light. As we speak, let our words be like light and life to the people around us. 
Lord, I ask a blessing on the rest of tonight and our break in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Bless you guys.